Welcome in to our first episode of CCL College Coach Live. Club Champions League soccer coach Chris Norris and William Mary Women's head soccer coach John Daly. Chris Norris has 25 seasons under his belt at the college and is his 12th year at the program's head men's soccer coach. He has guided the tribe to the NCAA tournament three times as head coach, including a berth in the Sweet 16. 21 years with the Tribe Women's Soccer Program and has guided the Tribe to 21 NCAA tournament appearances and holds an NCAA record of 36 winning seasons. So let's get started. Chris, if you wouldn't mind answering first, and then John, if you want to follow after. Um, what are some specific soccer-specific things you guys look for in players you recruit? Jackson, thanks uh, for the opportunity to be here. Um, I think that's probably the most asked question that we get from, from any prospective student athlete uh, or from all prospective student athletes. And really for us, it's, it's a matter of evaluating student athletes on four, in four specific categories, uh, technical, tactical, physical, and psychosocial. And, uh, you know, obviously there are variations within those categories depending on the position that a player plays and, and that kind of thing. Um, but really, we're looking for technically advanced players, players that have a, a high soccer IQ. Uh, there is a minimum level of physical requirement that, that we have. And uh, certainly players that are committed and hungry and, and willing to grow and have strong mentalities. Awesome. And John, do you, if you want to follow up on that. Sure. Well, I, I would echo everything that Chris said there. Um, what I would add is that not necessarily in any particular order. Um, there, I, I've had players who weren't particularly physical in the sense they weren't great speedy, speedy players. Robin Lotes was one of our All-Americans, an academic All-American, and Robin was one of the slowest players we ever had. But she had a great soccer brain, incredible control, and more in, most importantly for me, she knew that she wasn't fast. So she she never got caught in situations where her speed was a question. She'd sidestep a player, and then she would e immediately shoot, cross, or play the ball. She wouldn't try to outrun players. So there's a, a, a soccer smartness there i don't know which kind of category it would come under there psychological i suppose but that player who really has that innate soccer ability can get away with being less than top notch in those other areas awesome so along those same lines of that there's no specific ordering necessarily to what attributes will get you looked at um how big of a role do your specific team needs play in determining your recruiting class? Are sometimes you looking for a super fast player? Sometimes you're looking for a forward or a defender? And does that determine whether or not a player can come play for you? It, it makes a... If you'd like to go first on this one. Okay. Um, yeah, speed is something that you really can't coach. I think you can, you can add... Uh, fractions of a second to someone's overall speed and we do spend time with uh, our strength and conditioning coach who is very very good and she talks about running form etc um, but if a player has outstanding speed she can really fit in anywhere um, I think on a, a year by year basis we have to look at which players we are losing and where can we where do we really need to concentrate our recruiting? But we have to do that two and three years in advance now, which is not a good situation, but that's the way it is. Chris, how does it work on the uh, men's side? Yeah, I think ideally we start each recruiting cycle by analyzing the players in our program that we anticipate graduating and uh, we're, we're typically trying to be a year ahead of graduation losses um, so you know for our senior class in in that the class that we bring in that year we're really trying to find some players in in, in the incoming class that uh, can come in for a year and and potentially 
uh, learn from from those seniors so that we're not caught in a situation where we're trying to replace like for like players. Um, so it, there is an element of trying to determine what our positional needs are. Um, in the end, it doesn't always work out that way. We, we're really just looking for the best overall fit. Um, but yeah, there is a, an element of that initially where we are trying to target specific types of players or possibly even just specific attributes that players may have, whether that's speed, leadership, toughness, um, those kinds of things can come to the fore regardless of position. Awesome. And so with that in mind, how can a player best educate him or herself about your program, not just about its history in the school, but about how you guys play, um, what your personnel is like at the moment? Sure. I think, uh, you know, communication these days is obviously very easy and speedy. Uh, the first piece of it is, is really doing some soul searching, figuring out what kinds of things are important to to you in terms of selecting a school, um, doing research on the school itself, doing research on the program as much as you, you can, using the internet, YouTube, that kind of thing. And then <clears throat> if after doing those things, you've determined that you think that a particular school is a good fit, then trying to get in touch with those coaches, trying to get on campus, trying to see them train and or play matches, having sit down conversations with coaches or assistant coaches, um, and really asking good, hard questions about how the program operates, what they may be looking for, uh, and if they have seen you play, then whether they think that you might be a good fit or not. And uh, I would uh, agree with that 100%. I, I do f find that many players, when they visit, one of the questions they will ask is, well, what kind what style do you play and uh, you know we we try to keep the ball on the ground and I'll always tell them that we will try to play but then I'll all also add the caveat that if an opponent is filling midfield and we're not succeeding getting the ball on the ground through then we'll we'll knock it long a few times to try and get them to drop off so um our general style of play is to try and keep the ball. I think we play a fairly attractive style of game and the players that we recruit tend to be the kind of players who can fit in easily to our system. Awesome. Um, and so I guess in the same, along the same general lines, players spend tons of time on highlight tapes, recruiting services, crafting emails, etc after they get an idea about a school, what's the best way for players to communicate uh, with coaches? Do you guys look at recruiting services um, or is it mainly through email? What's, is, there, is there a common denominator that all coaches find to use? Um, I think it's my turn, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I will not use a recruiting agency and my, anytime I go to any college talk, that's one of my points of emphasis is that they do nothing that a prospective student athlete or her parents cannot do themselves and they charge a lot of money for the privilege of doing it. A video will alert myself or my assistants about a player's ability and then we do our level best to go and see them play live as it were. I don't mind watching an unedited film. I can soon tell. I won't need to watch for long. I'll soon tell in a few minutes if the player has the sort of um, ability that we're looking for. But in the end, it'll always come down to trying to see the player and to see her as often as I am permitted to see her. Yeah, I would agree with John um, for the most part on that. Regarding recruiting services, you know, our philosophy is basically to uh, leave no stone unturned in recruiting. So we definitely try to answer every piece of correspondence that we get, regardless of whether it comes from a service or not. However, I can tell you that our, our record of finding top players or finding good fits is not particularly good from recruiting services. We're, we're you know, much better off when we have direct 
initial communication from student athletes who are doing their own work and, and who have done some research already on, on our school. Um, in terms of contacting coaches, I think, you know, like I said earlier, communication these days is very easy. Um, you can certainly find coaches' emails readily on, on athletics websites. And in a lot of cases, you can, you can even find uh, mobile numbers or, or get them from club coaches in a lot of situations. And I think, you know, to send coaches emails or texts is, is fine, certainly. Um, what I would say is that it's more about the content of the email and the, or the content of the contact in showing that um, you have done your research, that you do know something about the program, and that you have reason to believe that it may be a good fit for you. You know, in, in many ways, recruiting is a numbers game. There are a lot of players out there that are looking for college soccer opportunities. And we get a lot of correspondence on a daily basis. Um, we, we have to have ways to kind of sift through that aside from just looking at a resume and thinking that somebody might be a good player. So when someone, uh, when it's clear that somebody likes our school because they've taken the time to do some research and to add some personal things into an email or, or a text or something, then it certainly piques our interest that much more. Um, what I would say about the video thing is I, I agree totally with John. The, the recruiting process for each individual for us is a puzzle and we're trying to fit as many pieces as we can into that puzzle. Video is certainly a piece. I would certainly recommend video if you are targeting schools that are a little further away from your home. You know, if you're looking at schools that are more than sort of three or four hours away where coaches may not be able to see you on a regular basis or at least initially in person, I think video is, is a great thing and is obviously very easy these days to create and, and uh, send those or make them available via YouTube or, or some other service. Awesome. awesome. Um, um, so, so in mind, in mind of being, being recruitable, recruitable what, what, what can what players can do academically to make themselves the most attractive student athlete? How should players balance course rigor and their GPA? William Mary is a great school. Is there specific things or specific criteria they – need to meet as a student, I'm sure? Uh, yeah, absolutely. The bottom line is uh, the better that you do in school, the more options that you'll have uh, in terms of, of universities that are available to you. Um, you know, William & Mary is a, is a terrific school academically. It's very competitive in, from an admissions standpoint. And while we do have the ability to assist players to a certain extent, those resources are limited, and uh, and so it's critical that and, and the standard doesn't deviate that much from our general admission standards. So it is critical that uh, for us, the student athletes that we're looking for have been dedicated students, have worked hard, have have done reasonably well, not just in the classroom taking a challenging schedule, but also uh, you know testing reasonably well also. And um, you know it does in our case limit our pool a little bit, but. But um, more importantly for us, we are trying to put student athletes in a position where they're finding the right fit, that this is the right fit if they do decide to come, and that they can be academically successful uh, without sacrificing too much on the uh, athletic and social side of things. Once again, I would agree 100% with Chris on that. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Okay. Um, what I would say is that, that William & Mary does tend to look at the, the all-round picture, the courses taken, the strength of the high school, uh, their testing. And one thing that I would always tell players, especially those who contact us in their sophomore year and are going into their junior year, I'd always tell them, make sure that you take the SAT or the ACT more than once. Because uh, obviously those, those scores can only improve. Um, one of the the key elements that makes William and Mary the the caliber of school it is is the selectivity of admissions and the fact that William and Mary is only going to accept that top sphere of um, players of students, I should say. And that doesn't mean that that there are players below that top level there that could succeed. Were they giving? 
given an opportunity, but they're not going to be given an opportunity. And that's where Chris and I can help out with that above average good student who doesn't have that 1450 SAT and that 40 and magna cum laude, etc. There is space for those uh, students who are just below that, provided they can do something for our soccer program. Awesome. And so we're getting some questions on our YouTube feed, and one of them is a person from Northern Virginia. And they're curious as to how um, early you can contact a prospect. Uh, does it vary between Division One, Division Two, and D Division Three schools? Um, and how do coaches normally get into contact first? Way, I guess. Is that me now, Chris? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, you, they, they can contact us whenever they wish. Uh, we cannot reply until September the 1st of their junior year. I'm not sure how it works in Division Three. I know they don't have those kind of strict regulations. There's a, a, a lot more leeway, but I, I really don't know what it is. One of the challenges, of course, for us is that a really top player contacts me when she's a sophomore. I'm not permitted to contact her. And I think that's one of those rules that the NCAA probably needs to, to reconsider because, you know, when we can't just be polite and courteous and reply to a phone call, there's something wrong. But that's the way it is, and it's something that we have to live with. But uh, they can contact us. They can visit whenever they wish, except during a dead period, which is in soccer is around the signing day, which is the first Wednesday in February. But other than that, they can come to campus and they can contact us whenever they wish, but, but we cannot contact them. And Chris, yeah. I assume it's a lot of the same for the men's yeah. game. The rules for men's and women's are, are the same. Again, like John, uh, because I have not worked in Division Two or Division Three, I'm not uh, familiar with those rules. But but there are different rules for for the different divisions in many cases, and um, you know that's something that you'll have to ask when you have the next one of these, and you have some some coaches from other divisions on. When players finally do get in touch with the school, and there is a mutual interest among the player and in the program and they decide to go on a visit, what, what questions should they ask when they're on their visits? Is it okay to talk about scholarship? Um, is there things that you want to hear from your players when they're on a visit? Yeah, uh, you know, I think, again, when, when a student athlete has clearly invested some time in, in trying to learn about the school and the program initially, so when they ask, intelligent questions that aren't just generic. I think that's that's a great starting point. Um, John mentioned earlier style of play. You know, I think, again, outside of what, what are you looking for in a player, the next question that I get asked most often is, what is your style of play? And that's a, it's a tough thing. And, and, you know, the reality is that probably most coaches out there are going to tell you that they play a possession-based style because either they do or because that's what they think uh, student-athletes want to hear. But um, I think, again, that's where going to see the team train, going to see the team play is critical. You know, you have to kind of make that assessment for yourself to a certain extent as well. Um, intelligent questions that, that show, again, that, that the player's given some thought to what's important to them. Things like looking at the roster. Let's say you're a goalkeeper, for example, looking at the roster and making a determination of, you know, what, what does the team have returning in, in terms of goalkeepers and what are the roles that those goalkeepers currently have? What is the coach's vision for your four years as a student athlete? Um, what types of things do they do that, that are regular or sometimes even outside the box in terms of player development? You know, if you're hoping to continue to grow as a player with the potential to possibly play afterwards. Um, obviously, from an academic standpoint, what are the predominant majors at the school? What are the, what are the most highly ranked programs? What, what do the majority of the players on the team um, major in or what are their interests in? Uh, how does the team perform academically? What is the culture like of the team? 
Does the team tend to get along well off the field? Um, you know, all of those things. What what type of schedule do you typically play? What is the scheduling philosophy? Is it to try to schedule in a way that gets you the most wins possible? Or is it to schedule in a way that gives you the best chance to potentially get an at-large bid to the NCAA tournament? Um, you know, there are a lot of a lot of really good questions. And I think it it really starts with players – doing that soul searching and figuring out what things are most important to them, not simply kind of regurgitating standard questions that they can get from a club coach or, or, you know, somebody who's been through the process before. Yeah. That, that was, uh, all, uh, very good points that Chris made there. Um, I think one of the questions I, I frequently get asked is, do you play freshmen? And um, my answer is always that I, I'd play in trying to put the best team together. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, if a freshman shows me that she can do the job better than a, a junior or a senior, then the freshman gets to play. Um, and by the same token, a senior cannot think that because she's a senior that she has the right to play above a more talented or a more hard-working player. I think uh, Chris would agree that you know we ha have training three, four times a week, and it's interesting to see how the different players will train each day, how much effort are they putting into their game. We had one player this past season who went out frequently on her own and got the balls out and went out and worked on, on her striking of a ball. And if you can imagine what that's like, you're out on the field, there's no one else around. Every time you strike a ball, you've got to go and, and shag it, bring it back. And she would do that repeatedly. And I, w I was aware of that and realized just what a hard working player I had there. And uh, I'd like to see uh, you know, more, of, more players with that kind of mentality. Awesome. And just a couple more questions for you guys um, before we get going here. Uh, what would you say the most important thing a player could do before entering college to give him or herself a head start? I know we talked about what maybe the biggest transition is, but is there something you recommend to your players the summer before they come that they should make sure they're doing? Well, fitness is certainly – a key element there because we we only have two weeks roughly of practices before we get going unlike a sport such as lacrosse women's lacrosse doesn't play until the spring so they have time the danger in i don't know if this is the same with the uh, boys soccer as it is with uh, girls but they're playing year round now there are tournaments every weekend there's and when you get into the spring and the summer, you have high school games, you have uh, ECNL, Super Y, National League, and then you get into June and July, then the regional tournaments take place, and those who are successful go on to the national tournaments, which are at the end of July, and then where the women are concerned, on August the 1st, they're reporting for preseason training. So trying to get that balance right with regards to the fitness side of things while at the same time avoiding burnout is very, very, and injuries, of course, is very, very important. Yeah, I would agree with John 100%. I think uh, the fitness aspect is huge. You know, we do provide our strength and conditioning. We, we work with our strength and conditioning staff to provide a summer program for our players, and that goes for the women's program as well, as, as most college programs do. Um, and I think it's critical that, that players do the best they can, depending on how much they're playing, what their teams are doing in that particular summer. Uh, it's critical to, to do the best they can to follow that program. I would say that, you know, 90% of the players that come in are surprised by the difference in the fitness level or in the physical requirements. Um, and I'm not talking about testing or anything. I'm just talking about what it takes to, to play a lot of minutes at this level. Um, or even just to train every day. <laughs> and so, you know, making sure that, that uh, you don't just assume that because you've been a player at a high level for a long time that you'll be fit enough for college soccer. I think putting those extra, you know, days in where you're doing fitness work is, 
is critical to that transition. The other piece that I would say is uh, trying to put yourself in, in a position where you're playing with players that, that are like the players that you'll be playing with and against in the fall as much as you can in the summer. So, for example, um, trying to find, on, at least on the men's side, trying to find a PDL team or an NPSL team to train or play with, uh, possibly, you know, an under-23 team, an under-23 academy team, possibly an under-23 league team that you can play with where you're playing against older players, you know, on a regular basis in the summer or you're training with older players on a regular basis over the summer. I think that uh, that will is, – is really the best way to, to make that transition a little bit smoother when we're talking about both the physical aspect and also the speed of play. Awesome. And that marks the end of our first CCL College Coach Live. Thank you guys so much for being our first participants. We are really grateful for the information you guys have provided and thank you offer some insight that our players and parents will be really receptive to. So thank you very much and the CCL is, is happy to have you. Thank, thank you, Jackson. You.